In this lesson, we'll look at research that attempted to isolate a memory trace to find the exact location in the brain where a memory trace was being formed for some learned experience. And the uh, example we'll use is fear conditioning. Now, fear conditioning is a specific example of a more general phenomenon called classical conditioning. And we've already seen in a previous lesson that we can train a dog to salivate to the sound of the bell. We present the food, we, or sorry, we ring the bell, then present the food, we ring the bell, then present the food. Pretty soon, the animal will salivate to the bell alone. It's as if the bell is predicting the presence of the food. So the dog is associating the sound of the bell with the presentation of food. At the level of neurons, we said that in the dog's brain, it, there's going to be a convergence of neural pathways. The bell pathway and the food pathway are going to converge on a common target cell. And then there will be neural plasticity in the bell pathway. So we get the growth of new synapses here in such a way that the bell now can produce the salivation response. So we have plasticity and convergence. These are key ingredients for associating one stimulus with another. And we'll see how that uh, it plays a role in fear conditioning. Now, in fear conditioning, the animal's put in a cage, and it hears a tone. These graphs down here are a measure of some of its behaviors. Blood pressure, and here we have cessation of movement. That's just freezing. Well, the tone initially is not significant to the animal. It's not afraid of, of the tone. So we don't see much of a rise of blood pressure, and it doesn't really freeze very much. Next comes the shock. Now the shock, the grid is uh, electrified and gets a foot shock. Well, that definitely raises the blood pressure of the animal and it freezes. This is a fear response. So the shock initially has the power to generate the fear response. Well, if we pair the tone and the shock and the tone and the shock and the tone and the shock and then play the tone alone, what we have then is a condition response. The animal is showing a high blood pressure spike to the tone and it freezes. In the animal's brain, the tone is predicting the shock, so it's showing fear to the tone. This is fear conditioning. Now, we've learned that the cortex has uh, specialized regions that process different kinds of information due to the inputs to that area. So, for example, we have the auditory cortex and we have the touch cortex. And we might expect that these regions of the brain would be involved in associating a tone with a shock. Again, the reason auditory cortex is auditory is because it's hooked up to the ears. So the tone pathway is this pathway here. There is a synapse in the thalamus. Thalamus is a, a, a brain structure deep in the brain. It's sort of like a relay station, you might say, for now. And the touch cortex receives its inputs from uh, sensory neurons on the skin. So the foot shock would come through this pathway up to the sensory cortex, the touch cortex. Now, there's a puzzle, though. When researchers were trying to identify the location of the fear conditioning memory trace, uh, some early experiments involved damaging the auditory cortex. You might think that that would prevent uh, fear conditioning, because if the animal can't hear the tone, how can it associate a tone with the shock? Well, there was a puzzle. Damage to the auditory cortex does not eliminate fear conditioning to a tone. So the animal can be trained to fear a tone even though its auditory cortex is damaged. And this suggested that there must be some other site of convergence for the tone and shock pathways besides the cortex. As it happens, we've already learned about the uh, hippocampus, but just in front of the hippocampus is another structure called the amygdala. The amygdala. And this is a very important structure in the brain. And again, we have two of them, one on the right, one on the left. So here we see the kind of the temporal lobe here has been cut away, and we see the hippocampus in blue and the amygdala in purple here. It sits just in front of the hippocampus. The amygdala is a brain structure that has been associated with emotional arousal. And it's often associated with negative emotions, but it, it does respond to positive emotions as well. It's, it's more like it's kind of tracking just important, significant uh, stimuli for the, for the animal, for the individual. Now the amygdala then, we're going to draw it as just this circle here, and here's the hippocampus. And now we'll see some of the wiring that uh, led researchers to focus on the uh, amygdala as the location of the memory trace for fear conditioning. 
Now let's first focus on the hippocampus. We have already learned that the hippocampus is going to receive information from all the sensory regions, making an episodic memory trace in the hippocampus. So that includes the tone and the shock and the training chamber as well, the context of the situation. But now we'll look at the, uh, the amygdala. So here we have the thalamus, and we have the shock pathway coming up through the thalamus. We know that the shock uh, pathway does go to the sensory cortex, but it also sends a branch and axon into the amygdala. So does the tone pathway. The tone pathway sends information to the auditory cortex, but also to the amygdala. So we do have a situation here where the tone and shock pathway are converging on one common target. These are neurons in the amygdala. So when we train the animal, tone, shock, tone, shock, scientists have gathered evidence that what's happening is we're creating a memory trace in the amygdala itself. So before training, the shock pathway is a strong connection. That's a strong synapse. The shock alone can generate a fear response. The tone pathway is a weak synapse. The tone alone does not generate a, a fear response. That connection is not strong enough. But if we do the training, tone, shock, tone, shock, then we get plasticity. We get the, the tone pathway is going to increase the strength of connection to the amygdala neuron. We get uh, not only the synapse will be stronger, but then we can get the growth of new synapses. And so here we see plasticity. So initially, the animal only shows uh, fear to the shock, but if we pair the tone and the shock, tone and the shock, it'll now show fear to the tone as well. And scientists then uh, argue that the amygdala is the location of the memory trace of that association between a tone and a shock. When scientists damage the amygdala after training, so here's the picture after training, if you then lesion this area of the brain, that eliminates the condition response. The animal no longer shows fear to the tone. In fact, if you damage the amygdala, the animal cannot relearn an association between a tone and a shock. Because after all, you're damaging the very place where memory traces are supposed to be formed for that kind of learning. So the amygdala then is understood to be the site of the memory trace for this type of simple association between a tone and a shock. Let's look at this again using some of our other vocabulary. We're going to have a training situation where we're going to pair a tone in the shock. So here we have the amygdala. Here's an amygdala neuron. And the activation of this neuron would uh, uh, send information down to the fear regions of the brain, and then the animal will show fear. Well, initially, the shock pathway has a strong synapse, so shock alone will generate fear. The tone pathway is a weak synapse. Tone alone will not activate the target cell, so no fear to the tone initially. But when we train tone, shock, tone, shock, we're going to get plasticity. We're going to get the growth of new synapses in the tone pathway, and we can call this memory consolidation. Right, so there's learning happening here, and the brain is changing as a result of that learning. There's a physical change here, and this will be then the memory tree of that learning episode. So the growth of the new synapses is the memory trace, and now the tone alone produces the fear, and we call that the condition response. Now we've also learned that it is possible to erase memories, because every time a memory is retrieved, it has to get reconsolidated again. And so we can think of this uh, using this diagram. If when the animal is trained, we, we play the tone alone, so we're asking the animal to, in a sense, retrieve the fear memory, then you block reconsolidation, then you'll have a situation where the memory is going to be erased. And we're indicating that by going back to the weak synapse that existed prior to training. So when an animal retrieves a memory, those synapses become sort of susceptible to change. They have to be reconsolidated to, to lock it back in again. In fact, there can be new growth if, if nothing interferes with that consolidation process. But if, after you retrieve a memory, you use drugs or chemicals to block the biological processes that are involved in this growth, you can actually weaken the memory. And so here the animal will have its memory erased because now the tone alone will not cause fear. So let's summarize the involvement of the amygdala in fear conditioning. So damage to the amygdala prevents the condition response from forming. So you can't train an animal to, to learn tone, 
uh, to associate a tone and a shock. And if you do train the animal to become afraid of a tone, uh, damage to the amygdala abolishes that memory, that condition response. So scientists argue the amygdala is the site of the memory trace. The CS and US neural pathways converge in the amygdala. Again, that's the tone and the shock pathways. Synaptic changes are, are occurring in the amygdala to generate the uh, condition response. This is synaptic plasticity. Damage to the amygdala does not eliminate the, the you are. Remember, that's the uh, fear to the shock alone. Other brain pathways can produce fear response to the shock. So what the amygdala is needed for is to, to associate a stimulus with a fear response. And interestingly, damage to the auditory cortex does not abolish the condition response or prevent it from being learned. And we, we saw this at the beginning of the lesson. This was the puzzle that led researchers to the amygdala. Now back to our brain here, showing the hippocampus and the amygdala. As it turns out, there are neural connections between the two important structures. So while the, uh, the actual memory trace for the tone shock association is in the amygdala, the hippocampus was busy forming an episodic memory trace of the event when it was being trained in that uh, chamber. And the two brain areas communicate with each other. And we can think of the nature of the communication like this. The amygdala, being a sort of emotional hub of the brain, is going to be signaling the hippocampus to really remember this event, right? That was a significant event, being put in this chamber and then having this tone and shock and tone and shock. So the emotional systems of the brain enhance memory consolidation. When something is emotional, uh, it uh, leads to better memory for those emotional events because structures like the amygdala are telling the hippocampus to do even more plasticity than you might otherwise do. On the other hand, the uh, hippocampus, which is making an episodic memory, uh, sort of uh, recording the context of the event, is signaling the amygdala to fear the context as well. So while the amygdala is making the association between tone and shock, the hippocampus is signaling the amygdala to also fear the training chamber itself. So again, the brain is simultaneously sort of making two kinds of memory, an episodic memory for the training experience, and then the specific memory trace that links the tone to the shock. If you damage the uh, amygdala, well, you're not going to get uh, a fear response to the tone either, but neither will you get a fear response to the uh, training chamber because you've eliminated that critical structure uh, involved in generating the fear response. But notice what happens, though, if we damage the hippocampus. Here, then, uh, we're going to lose the fear memory for the training chamber because we've, we've lost that information about the, the training chamber, the context of the training. However, we will retain the memory for the association between tone and shock. So if you damage the hippocampus, they will no longer show fear to the training chamber, but they will still f show fear to the tone. So we can summarize then the role of the hippocampus. During fear conditioning, animals become fearful of the training chamber. After training, placement in the chamber alone can cause fear. And this is again because the hippocampus is talking to the amygdala, telling sort of the amygdala to also generate a fear response to the context. Lesions to the hippocampus block fear conditioning to the training chamber, the context, but do not block the fear to the tone. The amygdala memory trace is still intact. So again, we have a situation where during one learning event, the brain is, is doing multiple kinds of processing. It's making an episodic memory in the hippocampal pathway, but it's also making a memory trace of this specific association that the animal is learning. The tone predicts the shock.